There was a debate on CNN It featured candidates who were top 11 A gathering of the Republicans At the library of Ronald Reagan It was the CNN Ronald Reagan Debate I would like to welcome everybody back to Presidential Speculatainment. You know what we're talking about, of course. A recent happening on CNN. It was not altogether boring. It was um, educational. And there were many strokes of uh, words that were painted at the Reagan Library in Simi Valley, California by the Republican candidates. Was it all politics? Policy proscriptions? We saw all sorts of, uh, I guess, art forms in the political realm. But I think... Um, Actually, Mike Huckabee kind of summed up maybe some of the tactics that were, were being used by these candidates to try and win your favor. Huckabee says, quote, Now, Jake, I've been listening to everybody on the stage, and there's a lot of back and forth about I'm the only one who's done this, only one who's done that. I've done great things. We've all done great things, or we wouldn't be on the stage. But it occurs to me, as we're sitting here in the Reagan Library, that most of us would like to pay tribute to a guy who, when he got elected, didn't get elected telling everybody how great he was. He got elected telling everybody how great the American people were. And he empowered them to live their dreams which is what I'd love to see us do by no longer penalizing the people who are out there working because they're taking a gut punch right now, close quote. Very insightful uh, and revealing about, um, you know, how to manipulate the public. Tell them how great they are. Right? Stop talking about, you know, how many jobs you created in Texas. So, Huckabee's on to something. And many of these other guys picked up on that. Kasich was really the worst when it came to, uh, you know, just painting these nice pictures of everything. He says things like, uh, quote, by the way, I think I actually flew on this plane with Ronald Reagan when I was a congressman, and his goals and mine are pretty much the same. Lift Americans, unify, give hope, grow America, and restore it to that great shining city on a hill. Ugh, close quote. Kasich was full of contradictions. He was asked, like, why he didn't want to bash Clinton... He says, quote, so we'll get to the point where we'll talk about Hillary Clinton or whoever the nominee is, his record. But right now, yes, I want to give people a sense of hope, a sense of purpose, a sense of unity, a sense that we can do it, close quote. And it's just like, well, you shut up already. Well, you shut it with the hope and change, right? That sounds like a familiarly bad summer pop album from years back that is now in the dustbin. But Kasich also says, you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to continue to talk about my record. Because there is, did you ever notice when people run for office, they run for president, 
They make a lot of promises. They don't keep them. Close quote. You know, it's it's a good point, but unfortunately it was contradicted by uh, some of the other, you know, things that were said by Kasich for uh, emotional effect. We did get, you know, some specifics. After all, the whole thing, it was three hours long. You know, on the day of the debate, CNN, they shifted the whole thing up an hour which effectively extended the debate from two hours to three hours. And let me tell you folks, that is a long time to watch a debate. Only a few commercial breaks, you know? It's like I didn't want to miss, you know, I don't know, a real fist fight or something. But so we did get a lot of... Uh, actual promises from the politicians and I'm not going to be going over every single issue under the sun, you know, on this podcast episode. Oh, come on, I'm trying to give the people what they want, just like the goons that are on stage. And, um, you know, so I know what everyone wants to hear first thing, you know, it's like, were there any cat fights? And, you know, what were the, uh, sound bites? What's the stuff that they're going to be talking about on the news, you know, as they try to, uh, milk ratings even more. But, you know, it turns out that some of the more interesting or sensational moments uh, did have roots in uh, in reality as far as, uh, you know, what these candidates are standing there for, right? It's to be your president, in theory. Um, I know everyone wants to know, how did Trump do... You know, what happened with Trump? What was the whole thing with Trump? You know, did he um, do anything, you know, very, very entertaining <laughs> and stuff, right? I mean, you know, um, now we've made him our jester. And so... If he doesn't entertain us now, you know, we're going to become like the spoiled peanut gallery. And uh, it's like, hey, man, we want to see a show. So Trump uh, was not a total clown or, uh, you know, insult flinger. I mean, compared to like his first debate... Um, of course, a lot of that was caused by Megyn Kelly asking very unprofessional questions. You know, bringing Rosie O'Donnell into the equation. Um, and this time around, you know, Trump came off a much more like, you know, one of these squares. Much more like an ordinary man of the campaign trail. But I think we are now experiencing something in the sort of getting to know you process with Trump. It felt to me like tonight we we peeled back another layer, you know, and, and kind of actually scratched through to, you know, what's really in inside that onion besides, you know, caviar. And part of that discovery was that Trump maybe doesn't have that much actually planned out for when he is president. 
you know that old expression, you can't bullshit a bullshitter. Take it from this guy. I think Trump might be bullshitting on some of this stuff. I just say that in the context of, I think what was one of the themes of this second debate, not only concerning Trump, concerning all the candidates, but with Trump in particular, we saw a lot of things that he said and learned how he stacked up on a fair amount of issues in ways that could only be described as vague. I mean, like, especially vague. You know, so, as we're more deeply flirting, you know, with this, I guess for the, you know, 20, 30, whatever uh, percent polled that are supporting Trump, uh, this sort of fantasy of him being president, by the way, a lot of these polls indicate that something like 60 or 65 percent of Republican voters are undecided. So as, as we see these big swings and variations in the polls, we just have to remember that the majority um, of the people that are going to vote, you know, haven't even weighed in when they take a lot of these polls, but then they're reporting, you know, about the 100% of the 35% or 40% that have made up their mind. And, you know, why would you make up your mind in September? So th these people are um, early mind maker uppers um, as it stands anyway. So Maybe those types of people are more likely to uh, to change their minds. Well, I got to give it to uh, Jake Tapper, who was the uh, the main moderator from CNN. You know, you also had Dana Basher, uh, who was a pretty classy lady, and uh, this guy who was just like. I saw he he's some kind of a conservative uh, radio host named Hugh Hewitt. And he was like sitting on the side, but they would throw him, you know, a question every now and again. But I got to say, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but CNN did uh, a decent job at moderating. But why could I possibly think that? I think it's because of how ridiculously low the bar was set by Fox News. I mean, I just think I went on and on about, you know, how awful the pundits from Fox News were. On the other hand, I think Jake Tapper had, like, the opposite problem. He was a pushover. He really was. You know, whereas Megyn Kelly was kind of like a dominatrix, and, you know, Fox was just, like, totally, sadistically sabotaging the candidates. Tapper, on the other hand... It was like too nice. The whole night, everybody was just, just jumping in, you know, out of turn. And they would even ask him, they would say, Jake, uh, Jake, 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 uh, can I talk, uh, Jake, can I say something about Iran? Jake, uh, and then Jake would even say, uh, uh okay, uh, okay, go ahead. It was like, you probably just lost the millions on the commercial break. He was wearing some goofy polka dotted tie. So, you know, Jake Tapper, you know, came off like a bit of a schmuck, but way more professional 
than the last debate. Having said that, how much time did CNN ask the candidates stuff about the main issues that are facing the country? Well, not a lot. Not a lot. Um, they spent about two minutes on Social Security. But, um, you know, they were just trying to get ratings for sure. I don't know totally, like, what their agenda is. You know, I didn't look up all their donations and stuff. Um, so we're not even going to get into that. But they started off real petty. Jake Tapper, he says, uh, thank you one and all for being here. There are many important policy issues facing our nation. We're going to get to many of them tonight, but <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, but he says, I do want to start off with some current events in the news. And also some of the comments that candidates have recently made on the campaign trail. What more important to discuss than that? Tapper, you're, you're totally tapping in to the adolescent, you know, uh, worshiper of gossip that's in all of us. So, uh, first, we got... Fiorina is asked about uh, Trump and, you know, some comments she had made about, you know, him not being, not having the right stuff to be in charge of the nuclear codes. Carly Fiorina was uh, given the 11th spot. CNN at one point they changed the like criteria and boom she was the lucky runt you know she got on that stage and so you know we're getting things spiced up a bit by Carly looking very uh very good I thought up there uh and I gotta say you know it was an interesting kind of a complimentary shade of Carly's hair color to Trump's. You know, it was just about two shades darker. But I don't know. I thought they kind of had a little bit of chemistry. But in kind of a sick way, you know what I mean? So anyway, so she, whatever, she is giving her answer and stuff. And then, you know, per the debate rules... Because one candidate mentioned another, Trump uh, gets his 30 seconds to respond. And so Trump started things off. Um, first thing he did was attack Rand Paul. He says, uh, um, so he's asked, okay, now what do you got to say back to Carly? This is the first question he's asked, right? He says, uh, well, first of all, Rand Paul shouldn't even be on the stage. He's number 11. He's got 1% in the polls. And how he got up here, there's far too many people anyway. So then again, per the rules, you know, Paul gets to respond to Trump. And that's, that is kind of the, uh, you know, the blowback when you attack another candidate is that usually... Unless somebody else uh, just walks all over Tapper, changes the subject. Usually the subject of your attack will have the final word. So in this case, uh, Paul responds. He says, I have to kind of laugh when I think of, hmm, sounds like a non sequitur. He was asked whether or not he would be capable and it would be in good hands to be in charge of the nuclear weapons. And all of a sudden, there's a sideways attack at me. I think really there's a sophomore equality that is entertaining about Mr. Trump. But I am worried. I'm very concerned about him. 
having him in charge of the nuclear weapons? Because I think his response, his, his visceral response to attack people on their appearance, short, tall, fat, ugly, my goodness, that happened in junior high. Are we not way above that? Would we not all be worried to have someone like that in charge of the nuclear arsenal? Um, so someone please deliver a memo to Rand Paul that we are definitely not way above that. In fact, people are loving it. Um, all this junior high stuff. Oh yeah, so then Trump responds back. Um, I never attacked him on his look. And believe me, there's plenty of subject matter right there. Big laugh. You know, I don't know if there's plenty, right? I mean, Rand Paul's hair, yeah, you know, it's curly. You know. Okay, so Jeb is kind of asked uh, the same thing about Trump. And Jeb says, uh, you can't just, you know, talk about this stuff and insult leaders around the world and expect a good result. You have to do this with a steady hand. And I believe I have those skills. So, you know, the steady hand thing, I got to give it to Jeb. It was a bit clever because the original question actually referred to, you know, Trump's finger being on like the launch button. So, you know, Jeb sort of pulled that out. But, you know, Jeb, I think, is working with a pretty serious speaking handicap. He's he's really not a good speaker. I mean, he's great at certain things, raising money, being related to presidents. It still just looks like he's in theater class. And he has not rehearsed his monologue enough times. I've been there. It is unbearable to sit through a performance like that. But I'm going to give Jeb maybe like a solid B minus for uh, his performance on the scene in debate. And he actually, you know, did okay, you know. And, you know, I'm just measuring in, like, all the basic 10 categories of of debating. You know, not really on points. I mean, not really, not really on, on substance, you know. But I'm just talking about, like, you know, coming off like he's a credible uh, person to be convincing everyone that he should be president. I thought he did okay. But we still saw his uh, lack of speaking ability on multiple occasions. He was searching for words in the moment and then, you know, said what he said. It's just like, it's like, Jeb, it's just so mediocre. You know what I mean? He says, uh, talking about John Roberts, who his brother appointed to the Supreme Court. John Roberts has made some really good decisions, for sure. But he did not have a proven, extensive record that would have made the clarity of the important thing. And that's what we need to do. It's like he's, he's trying to think of a way to describe, you know, what Roberts should have done. He's like, oh, okay, um, let's say we're different words describe different things. Um, um, he should have made clarity the important thing. You know, he should have made the, the thing that was important, uh, things being more clear. It's like, you know, Jeb, I think, I think actually you need to work on that. But again, like I said, as far as, you know, those polled and, you know, the crowd and Jeb's viability. 
Um, he is far from a shrinking daisy. He is not going away. And he will be somebody to contend with as this whole thing slogs on. And tonight, you know, he went from his Fox News debate performance of being solidly bad to a performance that was, you know, just downright mediocre, which is uh, an objective notch up. So I think he's going places. Um, Walker, right? He's like an excited dog on a leash. It just keeps butting in, you know. Oh, can I? Can I? Oh, 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 oh. And uh, so you know, he hijacks the the mic and he gets to say what he wants to say and says, "Uh, this is actually what's wrong. This is what's wrong with this debate. We are not talking about real issues." So you know, this is all during the first. Part, you know, I think for the first 30 to 45 minutes, the only questions that were asked were, uh, candidate A, you said that candidate B, you know, uh, had penis breath. Candidate B, did candidate A go too far? Or does your breath really smell like a dick? And then, um, it was really just like, you know, CNN just looked over the most petty things that have been said in the last five and a half weeks on the campaign trail. And now, you know, all that dirty laundry is getting aired. It could be kind of like a, a rating strategy so that people don't like change the channel, you know, right if they start watching at prime time. So, you know, maybe they they hooked the viewer uh, with the petty stuff. Whatever, we're still talking about that. And then Walker's like, brings up this point. And then Trump starts interrupting him. Um, because, well, Walker says, uh, but we don't need an apprentice in the White House. We have one right now. He told us all the things we wanted to hear back in 2008. We don't know who you are or where you're going. We need someone who can actually get the job done. And then Walker and him are like going back and forth. And we saw a bit of this from Trump, which I would uh, describe, you know, pretty plain and simple as, I guess, bad manners. Trump interrupted some people. But I got to say, you know, it was mostly during the first hour, hour and 20 minutes. And Trump really cooled off for the second half of the debate. And I think everybody did to some degree. But the first half was just a frenzy. Everybody was just walking all over Jake Tapper, trying to steal mic time. And because of that, I mean, that set the precedent for them to just interrupt each other. And, you know, different candidates did it, but Trump did it the most. So at this point on, I I think we're maybe 30 minutes into the debate. You know, Walker, originally, the point he was bringing up was like, why are we talking about all this stuff? Blah, blah, blah. And then he attacks Trump, and then Trump attacks back. And then they're going back and forth, going back and forth. Then we hear a little voice calling out, Jake, Jake, uh, the Jake Tapper it tries to get control of the reins. He, he starts trying to formulate a question, saying, a phenomenon going on in the race right now is the political... Okay, Governor Kasich, go ahead. And then Kasich just really... Ugh, you know, just made himself a fool. 
kind of saying what Walker was saying, but then just made his statement idiotic. Uh, if he just says, uh, listen, you know, I, if I were sitting at home and watching things back and forth, I would be inclined to turn it off. I mean, people at home want to know across this country, they want to know what we're going to do to fix this place, how we'll balance a budget, how we're going to create more economic growth, how we'll pay down the debt, what we're going to do to strengthen the military. So we just spent 10 minutes here. Jake Tapper jumps in saying, uh, we have a lot of issues coming up, sir. But shut up, Jake Tapper. Okay, because somebody is standing on a soapbox. Let's hear what he's saying, uh, Kasich, uh, but, but wait a minute. That's a lot of ad hominem. Now, I know that it may be buzzing out there, but I think it's important we get to the issues because that's what people want, and they don't want all this fighting. Tapper says, we are getting to the issues, sir. Yeah, I mean, Kasich has a point. You know what else nobody likes to hear? Is it is a complainer. Just a complainer. I mean, what's worse than bickering? Somebody just complaining about the bickering. Right? It's not like Kasich is uh, sitting on the board of, of CNN. He has no influence over, you know, fixing such a problem. So you're just bitching and moaning about it. Also, Jake Tapper claiming we are getting to the issue, sir, had no immediate intentions of doing that. Uh, because the next thing he asks about phenomenon going on the race is the political outsiders in the race. Talking about Carson Trump Fiorina. They, they all of them together uh, comprise a majority support in the polls. Now, just to give you an idea of what I referenced to earlier about Trump being vague, just to give you an idea, I thought one of his answers was notable. Okay, just listen to this, right? The question is, Mr. Trump, you say you can do business with President Vladimir Putin. You say you will get along, quote, very well. What would you do right now if you were president to get the Russians out of Syria? A specific question, the Russians are now in Syria. How do we get them out? It's really one of the most you know, basic, like, uh, questions rooted in reality. It has to do with spatial things, physical things, right? You can just describe how an object is relocated or various objects, you know. No nuance required. Just listen for the number of times that uh, Donald uses a certain phrase. You know, I guess it's it's simple. But is it too vague? And the phrase that he uses, is it adequate for the voter to... Anyways, he says, I would talk to him. I would get along with him. I believe, and I may be wrong in which case... You probably have to take a different path, but I would get along with a lot of the world leaders that this country is not getting along with. We don't get along with China. We don't get along with the heads of Mexico. We don't get along with anybody. And yet at the same time, they rip us left and right. They take advantage of us economically in every other way. We get along with nobody. I will get along, I think, with Putin, and I will get along with others. And 
we will have a much more stable, stable world. Now, it's like I already knew that Trump was a get-along guy. You know, he's got, you know, he's very charismatic. And, you know, he's charmed his way and dealt his way into billions. So, I think that's like what getting along means. You know, everyone has their own definitions. Like, siblings get along in their own specific way, you know, and like, oh yeah, so that that's the uh, answer, by the way is he said get along nine times. And I guess the the only other context he gives, well, he says he, he would talk to him. And of course we know he would talk to Putin in a way that they would be getting along. You know, maybe both doing some shirtless uh, horseback riding. And uh, the only other context we get is that if he was wrong, then he would probably have to take a different path. So we don't know what that path is. And we don't know what Donald and Vladimir getting along would look like. And we don't know how he plans through at least talking to get along with them. So, you know, I think at this point, like when you're dating somebody, you just want to try and get to know, you know, what's really, uh, what this person is about, right? There's a question of where's this going? You know, what are your intentions? Are you going to screw me over in the long run? Uh, and like, how long can I go where I just take your, your word for it? Or, you know, whatever. But maybe we're getting to this point with Trump now where people, uh, they want to know, you know, they want to paint a specific picture of, of a Trump, not just an abstract and he did say, you know, he's going to be releasing his tax plan in a couple weeks, um, announcing some key, you know, like foreign policy advisors and stuff. But Donald has really said uh, surprisingly little about why his skills, you know, pay so many bills. He just insists that they... That they do, and they will, and they should, and they shall. Uh, so I don't know, you know, maybe maybe the trance will, will last. So Jake Tapper says, So you, just to clarify, the only answer I heard to the question I asked is that you would, you would reach out to Vladimir Putin and you would do what? You, uh, no, Jake Tapper. He didn't say he was going to reach out. That would be more specific than getting along. So he didn't even go that far. And Trump, of course, says, uh, I believe that I will get along. We will do. Between that, Ukraine, and all the other problems, we won't have the kind of problems that a country has right now with Russia and so many other nations. Oh. Well, you know, reassuring. So put another way, why worry about how Trump will get along with somebody if the problem that you had in the first place, you no longer even have? No need to worry about the getting along because you no longer have that problem or that kind of problem. So it's a whole category of problems has been wiped out. So everybody's sleeping good at night. Okay, let, let, let's just look real quick at, at Bush. 
you know, because this is like, this is a critical juncture for Bush. This is where he could, um, I don't know, make a big gain on Trump or the guy who pays off the ref or, you know, breaks the other horse's leg. I don't know. So this question's coming from uh, this Hewitt, you know, guy. And so uh, he says, uh, I've done a lot of great interviews with all of you, but Governor Bush, I talked to you in February about the biggest elephant in a room full of elephants, which is your last name. And you said you would not be burdened either by your brother or your father's legacy in the Middle East. And then a week later, you rolled out your list of foreign policy advisors. And it was a lot of the band getting back together. So on behalf of the military that is watching, and Jeb says, uh, yeah. Okay, the active duty military that are at the end of the sphere. What kind of a commander in chief is Jeb Bush going to be? And who are the advisors that are new to your team? Bush's answer just shows, I think, that he's just, he's brushing off this question, basically. He says, well, first of all, you, if you're looking at Republican advisors, you have to go to the last two administrations. That happened to be 41 and 43. So just by definition, if you're and many of the people here that are seeking advice from the foreign policy experts on the Republican side, they they served in my dad's administration and my mo- brother's administration. Of course that's the case. But I'm my own man. So, you know, I love it, you know. I love the card that he plays there. It's like, well, I can't help it. I mean... How can you avoid two of your immediate family's administrations that were just in control in the last recent history? I mean, you know, these bushes are everywhere. Uh, You know, I can't avoid them. Being a bush myself, you know, it's like, you know, it's like he answers the question as if he's not a bush. He's like, well, you know, they're unavoidable. You know, I just so happened to... It's like, well, I don't know. I mean, that would be a bad answer if if it was not Bush. And they asked the guy, you know, why'd you hire... Why'd you hire all these advisors from the Bushes when they made all these big messes in the Middle East, you know? So then for some reason possibly ratings. Uh, CNN did a post-debate interview with Trump. I mean, it really felt to me like one of those post-game interviews, you know, where, where they just, everyone is swarming the court, you know, and of course the media people, they, they sort of position themselves and they tug on, let's say Dirk Nowitzki, right? And then he kind of just steps aside. All the madness is going on in the background and just takes a couple questions. And just gives his, you know, as he's still like panting and sweating. And uh, so Trump had this little interview. And he just said the phrase very well many times. Um, he was not bashing people. You know, as I said, by this time he, he was cooled down. But yeah, he didn't really have much to say. He said he had seen a family member and that they had said to him, wow, that was great. Uh, and then just kept saying, you know, everybody did well. Everybody, you know, he did very well. Everyone was, did well. You know, we saw a touch of humility, you know, to reference uh, Trump's Secret Service nickname, Humble. I think we saw a hint of that in Trump tonight. And I think part of that was because of the smorgasbord of topics 
that were covered that the candidates could not get enough of answering about. And I will give it to them as well. There were a lot of pretty good uh, things that were said about all these actual real topics and stuff. Uh, and then, of course, you know, more tomfoolery and, you know, some, some bad stuff. But I think Trump maybe had not read up as much as some of these other uh, folks because it really got hashed out. So stay tuned to the next couple episodes. We're going to cover basically what was hashed out. You know, the economy and taxes and minimum wage and uh, immigration and, you know, all these all these various things. You know, the debates are my favorite part of this whole ceremonious slog, you know. And, you know, it, it's going to be late October until the next one. But I think we will have plenty to study before that and figure out, you know, how to map these candidates. Um, but do not hold your breath. Uh, I mean, do hold your breath. I mean, what I'm saying is that it's probably going to be soon when these next ones roll out. Because um, I pretty much have penned the candidates onto that map already. So... Definitely keep on the lookout for uh, upcoming podcast episodes and uh, visit the website, which is really getting fleshed out uh, over the next coming weeks. Presidential Speculatainment.com. I'm Danny Winslow, your host, and it is my honor to be that. You know where to find me.